good afternoon and welcome to the finance track here at the ENI Summit. This track has been especially designed with the needs of our innovators and startup companies in mind. Uh, for those of you that uh, have not met yet, I'm Matt Bresnahan, uh, partner at the title sponsor, Wilson Sonsini. Uh, I lead our life science patent strategy practice uh, at the firm. I uh, split my time between San Diego and here in Salt Lake. I've uh, been at the firm for about 18 years now, my entire career. So uh, very happy to, to be here. We opened our Salt Lake City office about uh, just over one year ago, uh, which is now about 20, 20 strong, as you heard from Mark and Allison earlier today. I'm delighted to be your host uh, for this afternoon's session. Before I uh, introduce the, the moderator of our first panel, I'd like to first recognize our session sponsor uh, for this session, Freedom Capital Markets. And I'll ask Kevin Ernst, Senior Managing Director for the firm, to come up and say a few words. I just saw Kevin. There he is. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. First of all, I just want to thank all the sponsors and, and all the companies and, and everyone else uh, here. Uh, this is such a great event. And we're really, really uh, proud to be here. Uh, let me just give you a quick uh, kind of overview of Freedom Capital Markets. Our holding company is listed on NASDAQ. Uh, it's FRHC. We're about a $4.2 billion market cap company. Our parent company is based in Eurasia. Uh, we, Freedom Capital Markets, are the U.S. subsidiary, the investment banking arm. And, you know, for purposes of just streamlining this, because I can be up here for about 15 or 20 minutes giving you sort of the overview of all the different divisions, but I think what is probably most important to this group is we just recently announced the acquisition of a U.S. investment banking firm called Maxim Group. Some of you may be familiar with Maxim. They've been very, very active in the biotech space over the last 20 years. Um, so they're on board. We also announced the acquisition of a probably the premier, I would say, micro cap conference in the country. It's called LD Micro. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's a venue that started maybe 14 years ago. Uh, the founder's called, uh, his name is Chris Lahiji. It's probably one of the best micro cap, small cap conferences in the country. Uh, we just announced the acquisition of that uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, we're going to have our first conference in the beginning of June in, in L.A. Uh, so that's another, I think, sort of step for us to really work much more closely with earlier stage companies. Um, I guess just a, just a couple other takeaways about our, our firm. Um, I, um, one of my claim to fame is I spent nine, uh, almost 10 years at the New York Stock Exchange. I was in the IPO readiness group. Uh, our CEO uh, also was working with me 20 years ago, so we go back 20 years. So we actually have an IPO uh, readiness group where we'll help companies prepare to go public. Uh, and then obviously we have the investment banking side where you know, we're very familiar with dealing with you know, biotech companies. In fact, we just hired the head of research uh, for Citi. John Rogers, uh, he just came on board about three months ago. We're, we're really building up our research platform, which will be in conjunction with Maxim's uh, existing platform. And um, I, that's about it. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Uh, with that, I guess I'll turn it over. Uh, thank you very much. Connection to Utah is this woman right over here, Marcia Nelson. Uh, Marcia is someone that has been in the family office ecosystem for over 20 years. Uh, she's worked for a number of family offices. We actually, her and I are actually building the family office platform at Freedom Capital Markets. Our founder is probably in the top three wealthiest individuals in Kazakhstan. He's a Forbes 400 person. He owns 72% of the public company. Uh, but Marcia is very entrenched here, not only with family offices, but a lot with the venture uh, community. Uh, so that's really what brought us here. And I have to tell you, it's, it's been amazing. Um, we had a family office event here, Summit, a couple weeks ago. And the more I spend time here, the more I realize that this is a really unique ecosystem. 
and there's just so much potential here, and we're going to do whatever we can to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Small World Maxim actually led the uh, underwriting for an IPO, one of my first clients, about 15 years ago. So we're familiar with the group, and congratulations on that. Uh, we're exceedingly grateful uh, to Freedom Capital for their generous support today, and thank you again, Kevin. So turning to our first panel, uh, uh, and, and, Trent, and, and going to the earlier end of the spectrum here, early stage financing options. It's a very important topic for many new companies. Uh, someone once said that there's no fun in funding. I think Kelvin said that before. Um, but if anyone can make this fun, uh, this panel will, uh, and, and we're certain of that. So to get us started, I'd first like to introduce uh, someone who just got a, a brief introduction, uh, Marcia Nelson. Uh, I'll share a little bit more about Marcia. Marcia is a managing, direc managing director at Freedom Capital Markets and president of Freedom Family Office. Marcia has spent a large part of her career working in and for family offices and private deal makers. Over the last 20 years, she's developed a strong network of private families, institutional investors, and advisors. Marcia serves in a variety of leadership positions, including as chairman of the board of VentureCapital.org, a Utah-based nonprofit early stage accelerator, and on the board of University Impact, a donor advised fund, DAF, focused on impact investing. Uh, so with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Marcia, who will then introduce our panelists. Thank you. Yes, and we're going to bring our pa the panelists come on up, come on up, and there's also going to be some more seats here. So full disclosure, I actually grew up in Utah. I went to I'm going to totally date myself. I went to South High. Many of you know it as Salt Lake Community College. Now you know how old I am. Um, went to college in Cedar City. Can I, and my, my, I'll talk while my panel comes up. Um, my parents let me let me go all the way to Cedar City to college because we had family down there. And I met a really nice farm boy, and my parents were thrilled. And we graduated from college and moved to New York and have been there 30 plus years. So sorry, I'm like, these are hard to get on. <laughs> Please have my panel come up. So anyway, so I do have strong roots here. Um, my family's here. My son's at SUU. I'm really excited about this panel today and so excited to have an opportunity to be in front of you. Um, many of you I actually saw at venturecapital.org slash connect capital. I met some companies there that are here today. So it's nice to kind of like pull that all together. So so I don't know if there's a if somebody's going to keep time and tell me. Okay, thanks. Kevin will keep time. But really excited to have this panel today. I think that's so important that we talk about um, early stage investing, venture capital, and how do you access the VC space? So we've had a lot of conversations about um, you know, CEOs, fundraising, but now we're going to hear from the venture capitalists and how you can actually approach them. So, first, why don't we start off, Zashan, why don't you start us off um, and introduce yourself, and then we'll have Rachel and Bruce introduce themselves, and then we'll get do a deep dive into our family, uh, into our panel. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Marcia. Thanks so much for having me, and to everyone here, thanks for, for attending. Uh, it's been a great, great conference so far. Um, so, uh, Co-founder of MBX Capital, we're a early stage healthcare investor focused primarily in sort of being the first institutional round, so leading seed financings across healthcare. Um, about half of what we do is in life sciences, and that includes sort of you know, backing companies as, as, as early as um, university spin outs. Okay, wait, wait, I'm going to ask you to tell, like, how did you end up moving to Utah? <laughs> I think that's a funny story. And you'll all appreciate it. Uh, it, was, it was actually, I was living in New York, March 2020. I was out here skiing with my wife's family. And uh, we, you know, as, as things were unfolding, unfortunately, we, we sort of kept punting our return flight, which ultimately never happened. And <laughs> it was a, you know, a, a permanent relocation. So uh, I was very happy to get out of New York taxes and start paying Utah taxes. So uh, go Utah. <laughs> Rachel, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm skiing tomorrow, so I may be a new Utah <laughs> resident. Um, so I'm Rachel Butler. I'm the president of the Catalytic Impact Foundation. Um, the Catalytic Impact Foundation, which is a big mouthful, so we call it CIF, is sort of a hybrid type organization in that we are a 501c3 not-for-profit. Uh, however, we are uh, also uh, run an early stage venture capital fund. So we were really uh, created with the goal of um, addressing a big problem that we saw, which is funding for early stage companies. 
you know, after the sort of friends and family and before they were to the point where they, they could be more appealing to a larger uh, group of investors. So um, we uh, take donated capital, so we have no LPs, no GPs, which allows us to be very mission and impact focused. Um, and we, we pool it and we then run it as an early stage VC fund, except that if there are returns, they go back into the, the uh, fund to be reinvested for more impact. Uh, we are focused on uh, unmet medical needs, so accelerating innovation in areas where there is a lack or uh, lack of treatment or no treatments or uh, other areas that really need uh, technology and innovation. Thank you. And Bruce. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everybody. I'm Bruce Roberts, and I'm a managing partner of the Global Bioaccess Fund. We're a venture fund that's uh, actively deploying capital with uh, a group of LPs comprised of a number of prominent players from the financial and strategic realms of life sciences, uh, primarily in Asia and Europe. But we're investing uh, primarily in the United States and uh, the EU uh, in both biotherapeutics, uh, pharma, as well as in medical technology. Our therapeutic areas of interest are oncology, uh, diseases of the central nervous system, cardiovascular disease, and rare disease. And uh, like Rachel, we're really f focusing on fundamental unmet needs. Uh, I have an interesting perspective now, um, you know, certainly wearing the hat of a more traditional institutional VC, uh, having been in the life sciences space for now over a quarter of a century. Uh, in connection with the business that we built that established the Global Bioaccess Fund. Uh, I am a, a founder and a partner of a firm called RM Global, uh, which is a, a life sciences focused uh, investment uh, boutique, doing both investment banking and investment management. So over the years, we've uh, been active as a banker, of course, where we continue to have an active banking group doing mostly M&A but also uh, deploying capital into uh, early stage uh, venture opportunities through a variety of vehicles, including corporate venture uh, funds that we have advised or helped to manage, as well as special purpose vehicles. So certainly I, I've learned that the structure of these investment vehicles does matter and uh, look forward to uh, sharing uh, ideas with you today. Great, and I think we'll come we'll come back to that. So Bruce and I realized that we actually we both live in New York and we actually live pretty close to each other, but we had to meet up here in Salt Lake. So so every everything comes back to Utah, right? Um, I, 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 so let's let's drill down a little bit better. Um, I think there are a lot of companies here who are looking for investments. So I think we'll start with this question. So how do you find companies to invest in? And Rachel, I think I'll let you start this one off. Uh, well, we have a lot of incoming. Um, and we also uh, sort of very intentionally and strategically go to certain conferences to look for, for uh, companies of interest there. We also, um, you know, have a lot of co-investing relationships and a lot of relationships with other early stage VCs. So obviously I think, you know, one of the, the best ways is to get a recommendation from another organization because it sort of comes with that kind of uh, stamp of <laughs> somewhat of approval, at least, that, that they're making that recommendation. So I would say those are the, the main ways that we do, but we, we do try and make an effort to get out and really be intentional and go to the conferences looking for certain areas. So, you know, we have uh, you know, certain verticals that we focus on primarily, although we invest outside of those, which tend to be the, le you know, the underfunded areas, so children's health, rare disease, brain health, women's health, uh, aging, and then during COVID, seeing you know what went on there, we added health equity. So making sure that you know looking for technologies that can really help bring uh, equal access to good care to various communities. And Bruce, why don't you take that question too? Where where do you where do you find companies, and 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 why are you here? Sure. So I think uh, as Rachel noted. Uh, we find that specialized conferences, and I think conferences that are perhaps uh, not necessarily on uh, the list of everyone, uh, like a J.P. Morgan conference, like this conference, uh, you know, can be very uh, valuable for building relationships. 
Uh, we, uh, in addition to the, just the relationships we've built up in this space over the, the course of our years in the business, I think we find that a very fruitful path actually comes from our scientific advisory board. We've built an SAB that's it's to some degree comprised of the KOLs in the areas of therapeutic interest to us, and uh, we foster a very active dynamic with them. But uh, in the end, uh, I would say that uh, certainly the venture business uh, does uh, tend to function um, with a little bit of a group mentality, and uh, you know we certainly see that there's great value in referrals from trusted co-investors. And Zishan, I think I'll just pivot because we probably covered that question. So um, let's, let's talk about it from the other side. So what advice would you give to companies that are looking for VC funding and how should they approach you? How should they find you? I, I think, um, so I mean, similar to just getting in touch, right? I think always getting a warm introduction is, is most effective. Um, I'll tell you that the most compelling early interaction, right, usually comes from a very, very uh, well thought out narrative. Um, I think you know, we're, we're very early investors. We back first time scientific founders quite often, uh, people coming straight out of the lab. And you know, the, the most important characteristic that we sort of try to provide in feedback and, and what we help to sort of coach through is, how do you tell the story of the biology? How do you tell the story of the chemistry? Um, how do you tell it in a way that, you know, the, the investor across the, the, the table from you is probably smart, but they're definitely not as smart as you. And so it's easy to kind of get caught up in, in a lot of these nuances and things that you might expect them to understand, but you're, you're sort of maybe taking for granted. Um, so the most compelling pitches, you know, once it's sort of a warm recommendation, is is really coming with, you know, a, a narrative that you can you can almost you know pitch to a 12th 12th grader, right, um, who will understand it and it lands. And and from there, I think those are the engagements where like, wow, we really understood it, we we got there. This very clear communications. Then the VC, honestly, will want to engage you more, right? Because they're they're sort of a hook. Um, so that that would be sort of you know the, the main way I would kind of think about that. Great. And and Bruce, how should somebody connect to you? So uh, I think picking up on Zishan's point and also on a comment I made earlier, uh, of course we've heard it's important to do your homework, but uh, I think really trying to understand and drill down on the structure. Uh, and the incentives governing uh, the way in which the investor is investing is helpful. If you're a very early stage opportunity that is uh, you know, ultimately talking to somebody who is structured to return a payout within 24 months or 36 months, uh, that actually might not be a particularly productive interaction for either you or them. Uh, and then, of course, the things that I'm sure people are instinctively doing, which is looking to see what recent deals the investor has done, what areas of interest therapeutically uh, fall within their bio. All of those things can create connections where you don't necessarily need a super soft intro. I think any investor really appreciates when they sense that somebody pitching them is trying to save their time and figure out how to make them money, candidly. Great. And Rachel, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I, I would say that's pretty much, I mean, I, I think that pretty much covers it. Great. OK, so so let's say now now you've actually had a conversation with the VC. And how do you, how do you I, I guess not how do you, but what advice would you give to these entrepreneurs about making sure that they have the right money and smart money and not just any capital because because it really is an alignment. So so Rachel, why don't you take that one? Yeah, I, I mean I think that is important. And um, you know one of the things that I think works well is if you can get that initial investor really taking recommendations from that that person and introductions and and you know and also just really doing research on. Uh, you know, I know sometimes it seems like any money is worth taking, but it isn't always the case. And, um, you know, I think that to, uh, you know, really do some research and uh, be strategic about the people you have on your team, because they really are your team, and they're going to be with you for the long haul. And you want people who are going to be helping to pull the, the cart, 
Um, but I have really seen this in some of the, you know, we're, we don't often take board seats, but we do on several occasions if we feel we can be very helpful or, um, you know, it just makes sense. And I have seen some even first time CEOs do this really well where, you know, they really network with their network, with their investors. And it's just amazing how well that works. Um, so, and, and I think a, a, an investor who's really connected, engaged, and supportive will, will make the effort to help you get to the next stage. And obviously, that's often funding. Do you want to add to that, Sashan? And, and are there any red flags that you would give to an entrepreneur suggestions that they should keep an eye out when they're talking to VCs or other investors? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, you know, sort of reiterating um, what Rachel's saying, I would, I would talk to your network, get the references, know who you're kind of getting into business with, um, you know, and, and of course, if, you know, it's, it's difficult, right? I, I also wouldn't over-index on the references, candidly, because, you know, everyone's business relationship is different with who you talk to, right? Um, if a company's doing well, right, there might be, you know, a glowing reference. If a company's not doing well, there might be a negative reference, right? Um, so, you know, the key thing, though, I think is really more of the first principle and the expectation is, you know, this is your investor. It is a business relationship. Um, I think the biggest fallacy in, in our industry is, like, this idea of chasing entrepreneur-friendly, you know, investors. Um, none of them are going to be that friendly when things aren't going well. So I would, you know, I, and I'd say that, you know, it's like this, we, we lead rounds, we sit on boards, we're very active, we have a very sort of you know, candid relationship with our management teams. And I think it's a very important reality, I think, especially when the markets are not great, you know, that you really, really have to know who you're doing business with and know the relationship you're walking into. And the only way to do that is spend time with this investor, right? I think investors want to spend time with management teams. Management teams really want to run a process. And you got to pick this, like, the three that you're most interested in and actually spend time with them. And if you feel anything is off, I'm very big on intuition related to sort of relationships. If in your gut you're like, this is not really right, but the terms are good, I would, I would walk away. Right? Um, that's what I would do. And Bruce, you're nodding. You want to add to that? I certainly uh, agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think one additional point I would make is that Oftentimes, of course, uh, the kind of trade-off that every entrepreneur is, uh, you know, forced to make or needs to make is valuation versus uh, the in investor. Uh, and I say that in the in this context, many of you are potentially building businesses that will require a lot of capital to get to an exit. In in that capital generally can be provided uh, by specialized institutions with domain expertise. Other businesses that you're founding may not require that. But if you do see that you're going to at some point require serious institutional vetting and sponsorship and endorsement to get to the finish line, to get that uh, underwriting done or to get to that exit, then I would encourage you to not necessarily uh, ignore that early on in in re, in a chase uh, or you know in a goal to maximize valuation. In other words, if you have a choice between a value-added investor who's really going to put you on that glide path for the institutional capital that you're going to need, don't necessarily turn off a deal like that to take money from perhaps a, a less known or less experienced investor who may not be able to follow on, but will give you a bigger short-term valuation. It's getting the sugar high, but not necessarily the nutrients you need long-term. That's, that's awesome. I was, uh, I was recently on a venture team for venturecapital.org, and I was told that I was being mean to the investor, that, 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 I mean, the, the company that was presenting. I was mean because he had come, this was our third week, and he hadn't actually practiced his pitch like three weeks in a row. And, 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 and finally, I was just like, enough, enough. And somebody pinged me on LinkedIn and said, you're being mean. And I was like, this guy wants to come out and raise $3 million. Like, 
he needs to be prepared, right? You've got six people here, you know, like like you know, six people here, you know, wanting to mentor and help him, but you've got to you've got to do the work. So 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 that's my question is like, what are the red flags for you when you're looking at companies? I looked at this person, thought this isn't somebody coachable, and I don't know that I would be wanting to work with somebody like that. So Bruce, what are some red flags for you? Well, I, I think it's certainly. Um, Utilizing all of our EQs, uh, t you know, t you, you get a feeling about people, and most of us are in this business because we, uh, you know, to some degree like to deal with people as well as the science. But I, I guess I would, uh, I would say, uh, Marcia, I would really focus on their ability to listen and to take critique and then to see if they're actually filtering that back. And that, that's why I thought on the early panels this morning, a very powerful bit of advice was, I think Dan LaMaitre mentioned it, which is you might have that first pass, but take note of what you promised that you were going to do, and then go back and tell them what you did, or you know, take note of what they said you need to do before you get money from them, and go back and tell them that you did that. I think that shows a level of listening that really resonates with investors. Absolutely, Rachel, any red flags for you? Uh, well, I would say that <clears throat> at our initial stage of, of sort of assessment, we look at three things. We look at, is there a significant unmet medical need being addressed? Uh, is the science, even if it may not be developed enough to even be the proof of concept, is it based on you know, sound scientific principle? And thirdly, the team. And, and the third is really the first. So I guess the biggest red flag is, you know, uh, I think it's really important for the CEO to be a, a good storyteller. And I can't stress how important that is. We actually have a company that we actually did invest in because we love the science. We love the mission. It's a huge unmet need. But he can make a really exciting technology <laughs> seem like so humdrum. And, and <laughs> I mean, it's, and every time I listen, I'm like, okay, we gotta have another, we gotta have another meeting. Because, but the good news is he is coachable, and he's and he's you know dogged, and he's persistent, and he's got everything else. But he has to learn how to tell a story because, you know, on the other hand, you can find some sort of technologies that are like, yeah, but they it's such a great storyteller. They have you in the palm of their hand, and and so I think that's really if someone in this case we did invest, but if someone is not a good storyteller, and also as you mentioned, not coachable. I mean, coachable is huge because we often will invest in first-time CEOs or scientific founders who are running the company. And that is okay. I mean, we love to see an experienced team that's had four exits, but, um, but that's okay if they are asking the right questions, listening, and have a, you know, a natural knack to tell their story. Because you know, one of the issues is that you're not just whether you're going to invest, but you want to know that other people will invest too. And if you think this person isn't good at raising money for such a reason as that, um, you know, if that, that is a red flag. So I think um, being coachable and being a great storyteller, I think, are two really important things. Great stories. Zashan? Yeah, not much to add. I mean, I think I would sort of look at it as, you know, a combination of, of what's been shared with... Um, yeah, it's essentially like EQ, right? I think it's um, very, very hard to build a team without EQ. I think it's really hard to raise capital without EQ. I think it's hard to get people um, to do deals with you without EQ. And, you know, the way you kind of look for that is just, yeah, again, sort of through, you know, how intellectually honest is this person? How are they responding to feedback? How are they engaging kind of the cadence and so forth? Um, and, you know, I would tell founders, you should always be yourself, right? You shouldn't over... Um, you shouldn't you know, perform right in, in these conversations because I think that also leads to really really negative outcomes for for everybody. Um, so it, it, it all sort of ends up fitting. I think there's a lot of nuance to this question too, depending on the type of company. But uh, there's there's a there's something about EQ that we really look for, and if, if it's if it's there or not. Can I add something? Please. <laughs> Just thought of it. Something that you said made me think about. Um, I th I'm always impressed by someone who undersells. Like the hockey stick thing, where like I know we're here, 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 but it's just gonna do this, and I love it when someone is just very honest, and that's what you you mentioned that just honest about conservative goals, but really making you believe you're gonna meet those, and I think 
So a red flag would be overly optimistic projections, I think. It's, it's really funny thing in our business because, and I mean business be the whole venture thing, is like, you know, you look for personalities and personalities we've sort of been, you know, trained in some ways to think that, you know, these people are going to be amazing capital, you know, raisers and so forth. Um, but there's also like lots and lots of frauds out there. And, you know, you, the only way you could really kind of like hedge against that, I think, is engaging with somebody who's, you know, who's, who's humble, right? Some humility in the engagement, right, goes a really, really, really long way, I think, to building that um, early sort of political capital, early trust. Um, so, yeah, totally great. I think it's a big one. One of my, because I'm the moderator, I get to do what I want up here, so sorry. <laughs> one, one of my pet peeves is that, like, I, people, get, you know, people come, yes, they have the hot, this is the best thing ever, no one's ever done this before, you know, th those are my favorite things. But my real pet peeve is, is when I find an, an entrepreneur founder who's surprised when I ask, how am I going to get my money back? Like, what's your exit strategy? And they're like a deer in the headlights because they've been so focused on fundraising that they've never thought about the next step. And I said, look, you have to put yourself in the place of the investor, right? Like, like if you want, like if you're coming to me for a charitable contribution, then 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 we won't discuss an exit. But if you want, <laughs> if you want a long-term partner, and and then let's then let's talk about what the exit is. So so I want to hear from you. Like, what do you think about exits? What do you think about follow-on capital um, and 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 building an ecosystem around yourselves for fundraising for your companies? And Sushant, I'll let you take that. Sure. You know, I mean, it's, a, again, nuances is what, what, what are you building, you know, kind of what you're looking for. Um, in, in life sciences, right, I think generally these are acquisition-driven markets, right, for the most part. And so for us, it's kind of just having an intuitive understanding of where your market is, right? Because really understanding downstream, right, if this works, like, if this breaks right, you know, what, what this can potentially look like. And not expecting people to have like dual terms ready to go. And you know, I think a lot of the market comps are sometimes you know, not fair because what does the world look like five years from now? Um, but having an understanding of you know, this is how we think that it, you know, if we hit these milestones, we can land in these places and this is what we think this is sort of valuable based off of you know, whatever framework you're presenting. That clarity and thought is really what we're looking for. You don't control what happens, right? Um, we, none of us do. But if you have clarity in thinking around how c it could work out on that side, on the transaction side, it, it you know, gives you a lot of lot of credibility in, in, in our eyes. And Bruce, why don't you take the, that question? Sure. So I think that when you look at how assets are valued, uh, they say you can, in old school, you look at the sum of the parts. Uh, what it would cost to rebuild them. You look at the, secondly, discounted cash flows. And thirdly, you look at what a knowledgeable uh, industry buyer would pay for them. And even in the, uh, you know, the somewhat uh, creative realms of venture, I think those three fundamental parameters of value still apply. But I would say especially the third one. When we uh, structure our investment programs, we try within reason to be as agnostic as possible about the current state of the IPO market and to you know, look at uh, our investments and structure our investments so they would deliver a superior return if the only exit available were an M&A or a licensing exit. And, you know, I think that obviously current, uh, you know, trends uh, I think are forcing perhaps uh, programs that were relying on a very frothy IPO market to uh, get back to those basics. Uh, in med tech, I think that to some degree, n they, those, no one ever really left those basics because it was always a less, uh, I think, uh, congenial early IPO market. But uh, certainly that's front of mind for us these days. And, and Rachel, you wanna add that, like building a coalition around um, your funds, you talked about, you know, having other VCs and other follow-on partners. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I think to the point of exits, even though we are a not-for-profit and have no LPs, GPs, baked into our model is we want to get our money back, we want exits, and, um, and the idea being that it will become, at some point, a perpetual self-sustaining fund that re regenerates itself. We, my uh, colleague Rick Lipton t coined the the phrase regenerative philanthropy. So, um, so it is important, uh, exits, and, um, and I think actually, to your point, most likely an acquisition is, is the most likely outcome. 
So, uh, you know, a big IPO would be great, but we're happy with, you know, a 2x, 3x, 4x, and if we can do that consistently, that, that would be great. Uh, we'd love, you know, a 20x, but... <laughs> so, um, yes, and so, yeah, I think having co-investors uh, that we feel can be supportive and help along the way and make sure that... Uh, we can be helpful, and this and this group can be helpful. Getting them toward the point where where that something like that is possible is is a huge part of what we do. Can you just talk a little bit? I think each of you about the structure of your funds, the the size of uh, investments that you make, because I think that would be helpful for this audience. And and Rachel, I'll let you lead that one off. Uh, yeah. So um, we tend, as I mentioned, I think we, we go in quite early. I'll, I'd say, <clears throat> actually, we looked at all the numbers at the end of 2022. 50% is seed or pre-seed, 50% uh, of our investments. Another 30 is Series A or 30-something. I think there's sort of 15%. Uh, those numbers didn't add up. 15% uh, or so that it's after a Series A. And we do do uh, follow-on uh, maybe you know a quarter of the time. Uh, we have 47 investments. We also have had four exits with another on deck, which is amazing, as we've only just um, we made our first investments at the very beginning of 2019. Um, we have an initiative to invest in women founders, and that is something that we instituted back in 2019. We're now at 50% of our companies are led by women, and um, that has been a... a classic case of doing well by doing good, because some of our best companies are women-led. Um, yeah, so uh, we tend to go in, you know, with as little as 100 to 250,000, maybe go up to 500,000. But uh, what we also, you know, try and do is, as the name suggests, catalytic, is to uh, be strategic with how we do that and have that be catalytic money where it can help bring in others. And there's a Actually, one company um, two years ago, I guess, that we, we had been following this company before it was even a company, and then we were the first check-in at 250000 and we helped them bring in $2 million. And so that's sort of, we would love to have more capital and be able to, you know, do more than that, although I think given sort of how, how and where we invest, probably we wouldn't probably go much more than a million. That would probably be the ideal. So... Great. So, we are, as I mentioned, sort of primarily seed stage investors. So, 75% of what we do in a, in a fund is going to be sort of first check, seed stage. We invest one to three million dollars at that point. Um, you know, a quarter of what we do is you know, exclusive of, of, of uh, full ons is, is Series A's. We'll you know, be more of a co lead in the Series A situation, um, but you know, investing anywhere from two to five million at the Series A. Uh, we're very concentrated uh, investors, meaning you know, if you look at our fund, you know, you'll see maybe 15 names per fund, which is uh, highly unusual for seed stage funds. It's because we uh, are very thesis driven. So, you know, one way that we sort of work with some of our investor entrepreneurs is sort of make, making sure we're sort of aligning on an area that we're we're bullish as as investors. Um, and so, if it's in there, then you know we've done a lot of work. We hope to be pretty pretty active in supporting the company as an early investor. Um, and you know we'll, we'll sort of support it and fall on financings. Um, I think generally speaking, we are um, investing what we call public health opportunities. So typically looking at companies that are addressing you know challenges related to large population effect sizes. So we look at a lot of common diseases, things like that. We do not invest in rare diseases. We don't really do immuno oncology, things like that. You know, important areas, but smaller markets. Right. And Bruce. So we're investing with uh, the Global Bioaccess Fund a bit later than the seed investing uh, that my colleagues here are doing, uh, and a bit later than some of the other uh, investment vehicles that we've sponsored at Arm Global. The Global Bioaccess Fund uh, is, uh, we expect it will probably top out at about 100 million, perhaps 120 million. Uh, we did a first close uh, late last year of 75 million and are actively deploying out of that. The uh, Structure will be uh, approximately 10 to 12 investments with first check sizes of 5 million, and then a uh, certainly a, a reserve for at least that amount for follow-ons. We have a very deep-pocketed group of LPs, including uh, our anchor investor, which is a very large financial institution in Asia. So we have the ability to 
you know, structure much larger investments over time as the companies advance. But with that focus, we're really looking for opportunities that are at the clinic, in the clinic. Um, I would say with immuno-oncology and certain areas of oncology where the readouts and the M&A exits can happen earlier, uh, we will go pre-IND, but uh, that's our sweet spot. Great. I think we have time for one question because the next, next team is just about ready to come in here. So if somebody has a burning question that they want to ask, go ahead. Somebody want to raise their hand? And if not, I think we'll just say thank you then to our panel. This is great. Really want to thank all of you. Oh, I'm sorry. There was a question over here. Nola. All right. Nola's question was, how do you get in touch with, how should people get in touch with you? Uh, you, can, you can say hi after this panel. Uh, and then uh, I'm at Z, just the letter Z, at mbxcapital.com. And you're also on LinkedIn, too, yeah, of right? Of course, yeah. Of course, always on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll be here uh, all day and also at dinner, and um, our butler at, at uh, cifimpact.org. And Bruce? Yeah, the same. I'll be here, and uh, you can reach me at broberts at globalbioaccess.com. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again. It was Thank a you. great panel. Thank you. Thank you.